Hey everyone, it's Paul Bertarelli reporting for AbWeb from a windy hot ramp in Miami, Florida. You know, if you read uh, AbWeb much or any aviation news at all, you've probably read that the world is going to need like a gazillion pilots by like next month. So that means we're going to need about a gazillion trainers and one company that hopes to do that is Vulcan Air with this airplane behind me which is called the Vulcan Air 1.0. We're going to take a look at this airplane. It's got some interesting details, but first, who the heck is Vulcan Air? A fair question for sure. Vulcan Air is an Italian company located in Naples. They opened for business in 1996, building aerospace parts, and in 1998 they bought the company that made this, which you may recognize as a Partenavia P-68 twin. Still quite a few flying as utility and trainer airplanes. Vulcan Air offers that airplane in five versions. In the distant past, Partenavia also made this airplane, the P-64, and several variants. If the V1.0 looks like the P-64, well, you can figure out why. Okay, that's Vulcan Air, so back to the airplane. Very similar to a Cessna 172, here are the dimensions. It's a little smaller, a little lighter than a Cessna 172, but otherwise it's quite similar. It's got some important differences that I'll get to in a minute. IO360, 180 horsepower, fuel injected, so you don't have to worry about carburetor icing and that's a big deal in trainers because a lot of accidents have occurred because of carburetor icing. The airplane itself is uh, constructed of a steel welded steel cage. You can see it uh, the down tubes in the front and that's attached to a conventional monocoque riveted aluminum structure. It's kind of like a Mooney. Uh, so that makes it a pretty quick build, and if you look at the construction of it, it's pretty much conventional except for the welded steel fuselage, conventional riveted wings. They do use composite in this airplane, and pretty cleverly too. Let's take a look at the door. Now the door in a Cessna is a multi-piece. It has a, an aluminum uh, framework, and then it has a liner and, and kind of some upholstery or paneling on the inside. Well, in the 1.0, it's a single piece composite and the door handle is incorporated right into the, uh, the single piece composite itself, serves as a nice armrest and all of the latching structure is inside. So it's really light and very stiff. It, let's take a look inside the airplane and it's very simple. It's very utilitarian. Uh, when Chris uh, Banaj and I fly, we'll talk about the details of it but it's a no frills interior, but it's well finished. And looking back, it has uh, four seats and there's a baggage compartment. You can actually access the baggage compartment while you're in flight, so that's kind of handy. The landing gear is pretty conventional stuff. It's a uh, spring steel landing gear and the front gear is a steerable nose wheel. A lot of airplanes these days have castering nose wheels so you steer with brakes, but not this one. And, but the interesting thing about this airplane, what makes it really unusual, is what's on the right side of the airplane, which is a third door. So you can access the back seats, and I've been in and out a couple of times, and there's enough leg room. It's not, I wouldn't call it generous, but there's enough. And if you slide the pilot seats forward in the flying position, you've got just enough. Now, will it carry four people? Well, it absolutely will. The gross weight of the airplane is around 2,550 pounds. It's got a useful load somewhere in the 860 pound range. So if you fill it full of fuel, that's 50 gallons, you've got enough left to carry probably about uh, three people and some baggage. Here are the actual numbers, uh, and that compares it to a Cessna 172 and a PA-28. So yeah, you can carry four people in it. More likely, you're gonna carry three people, maybe full gas, and then a little bit of baggage. But more likely than that, this airplane is intended as a trainer, and a lot of training organizations like to train with three people. They have an instructor, a pilot, and an observer, and then they switch seats and carry on with their training. Since the 1.0 looks like a Cessna, no surprise that it taxis and flies like a Cessna. Cockpit visibility is mostly good, and the steerable nose wheel is a plus. It does have a constant speed prop, which is a little unusual for a primary trainer, but I'll take it without complaint. With 180 horsepower and at a middle weight, 
The V1.0 doesn't exactly leap off the runway, but it doesn't dawdle either. Because it has a stabilator, not a conventional elevator, it's a little heavier in pitch than I expected. Initial climb rate is about 800 feet per minute. Uh, we just took off from uh, Miami Executive, otherwise known as Kendall, or, or Tamiami Kendall, I guess it's got various names. Uh, initial climb out in this airplane, seven to 900 feet a minute, and uh, we're actually at only 1,100 feet. Uh, we're trying to get out from under the Class B uh, Miami so we can get some uh, airspace to do some maneuvering. Uh, Chris, we talked about cruise. Uh, this is not a normal cruise altitude, but it's a, maybe a normal cruise setting, which is 24 squared. And uh, we're about uh, 10 and a half gallons an, uh, an hour. That's giving us 110 knots true. If we were at 6,000, that would be 120. 125 is what uh, I got at 5,000 with this power setting. Similar fuel burn uh, at altitude. This airplane will be used a lot for training, so uh, block to block, what kind of uh, uh, power settings and uh, fuel would you expect to burn? It's going to be doing a lot of climbing and maneuvering and so forth. Yes, uh, we were discussing that the other day. Uh, you know, we haven't put it through its paces in that sense, but I think somewhere in the eight and a half to nine gallon an hour range. Um, so that's going to be comparable to a 172, maybe a little bit more, or a little bit less depending on how it's used. Correct. I think overall we're probably going to be about a half a gallon an hour higher or something in that range based on what we've seen so far. Now we talked a little bit about, uh, before we took off, about whether or not this airplane would be used by private owners, and there's interest in that. So uh, it's an IFR approved airplane, so you, you could certainly use it for IFR trips of 500 miles and have a comfortable reserve. And a comfortable reserve and decent useful load, you can definitely yeah. uh, you know, take three people in bags, no problem. Yeah, by the way, at that full fuel, we do have room for three normal-sized people in baggage. Correct. And we got room for them because we got the extra seat and the baggage compartment. How about range and endurance? Well, here's how it stacks up against the Skyhawk. The V10 is definitely faster than the Cessna, but a little thirstier too, and here's how that shakes out on a long cross-country. At 65% power and allowing for a 45 minute reserve, the Vulcan Air is good for 494 miles in still air, while the slower Skyhawk would fly 585 miles. On the same 500 mile trip, the V10 gets there 12 minutes sooner. While we're climbing up, make some comments on the uh, cockpit design here. One of the really nice things about this airplane, and I'll show it on some B roll, is there's a center pedestal with a big honking trim wheel right on the uh, left side of it, which is right by your knee. So if you have your hand on your knee, which I usually do, you can just use one finger to trim it, and the trim is very precise. Uh, no electric trim in this airplane? No, not as of yet. No, Yay, no I like manual trim, old school. And then the rest of the pedestal contains the uh, throttle, the prop, and the mixture. And it's really all nicely machined uh, aluminum uh, and it's really nicely labeled, almost looks like a uh, military aircraft. And then further down the pedestal is the fuel control uh, and the uh, brake lock. And to get at the jacks for the headsets in some airplanes is a little difficult. This one, they're right down there in front of everything so you can see them. It's pretty well designed. In the back, the headset jacks are on the ceiling. And they're easy to see, so you can just plug in. You don't have to fish around for them. And that's a problem with some airplanes. They put them where you can't find them. Well, the previous standard, because this is a uh, G500, but the new ones are going to have a 500 TXI. So let's talk about that standard avionics package. That's correct. The way that this aircraft is equipped is, is as standard, as you mentioned. It's G500 equipment, GTN 650. And GNC 255 with an audio panel, uh, and you got a JPI 930. Now, once we go to the TXI, uh, we no longer need the uh, JPI 930, and it'll all be integrated into the 10-inch screen of the uh, Garmin 500 TXI. The Vulcan Air's handling holds no particular surprises. It's relatively light in roll, but stiffer in pitch because of that stabilator I mentioned. 
in a steep turn, you need to apply quite a bit of back pressure or maybe use a little nose up trim to hold the altitude. I didn't, so it didn't. Stalls are similarly benign with a couple of twists. First, as you'll see here, Chris gave me a last second pull on the yoke to actually reach the stall angle of the tack, and then... Hey, we got a very loud horn at uh, 51. Holy Christ, that's loud. <laughs> that's if you don't hear that, you deserve to die. <laughs> we need to tone down a little bit, but it's not a bad thing. <laughs> it's bad okay. for the instructor. Okay, so aggravating it with pitch back. Easy to hold the nose with the rudder. And basically, it's got a parachute mode. The descent rate's about... Uh, uh, wow. Five, four, one, five, Between three and five hundred feet a minute, it looks like. Your reaction was priceless, so this <laughs> makes for good video. <laughs> <laughs> when I was doing the intro, I pointed out that this airplane is made with a steel cage in the front, and then after that, it's a standard aluminum um, monocoque riveted structure like a Mooney. Most airplanes that are built that way by necessity have down tubes, and down tubes run from the top of the fuselage cage down usually to the engine mount. This one has the same thing. But what's different about this one, you can see it from this view, the down tubes are far to the left and right, so the forward view is unobstructed. And a lot of tail draggers or other steel tube type airplanes, you kind of have to adapt to having a tube right through the middle of your field of view. But in this one, you don't, so that's kind of nice. Furthermore, if you looked aft, and I'll show you a view of that too, you've got a nice window in the back, and then you've got some sub-windows between the passenger windows and the back window, and there's also a nice skylight. Uh, that's a two-edged sword. It gives you nice uh, visibility and lighting in the cockpit, but it gets a tad warm when the sun is high, and today we're uh, off the coast of Miami. The temperature is 192 degrees. <laughs> and it's probably 150 in the cockpit. Well, not quite, I'm exaggerating, but it does get warm. Um, and that sort of goes with uh, the territory. The vents in these airplanes are eyeball type vents. Uh, they put out a fair amount of air. Uh, on the ground, we have the doors open uh, for taxi, and that's certainly adequate. This class of airplane is not likely to have air conditioning, and I'm not sure I'd want it if it did because of the weight hit. And the back seats also have uh, vents up above, so you move a fair amount of air through this cockpit, and it's pretty quiet. There's not a big roar of uh, ventilation, so uh, as long as it's not too terribly hot, the airplane's comfortable inside. So we'll go down and uh, back over to um, executive and try some landing. While we're heading back to the runway, let me point out something. Notice that from this view, it almost looks like there's no one in the cockpit, just sort of these disembodied hands hidden by the B-pillar. What that means is that visibility is good forward and directly out the sides, but in the pattern, you have to crane your neck forward of that pillar just in case there's traffic you might have missed. Landings in the Vulcan Air are nothing special to master. It does have old school flaps that have an indicator rather than presets. You can use 28 or 42 degrees for landing. With the 28 degree setting, the airplane lands a little faster, but it's easier to keep the nose wheel from plunking down before you want it to. The airplane is very trim stable, maybe more so than the Skyhawk. Once you've tweaked the trim, say for 70 knots, it rides like it's on rails. Students and instructors should like that. And flight schools will like the price. The base price for the Vulcan Air V1.0 is $278,000 compared to $390,000 for a new Skyhawk. And that's for a fully equipped airplane, not one stripped of options. So that's a pretty good overview of the Vulcan Air 1.0. And uh, you can find a more complete review on this airplane in the uh, December 2018 issue of Aviation Consumer Magazine. I'm Paul Bertarelli reporting for Aviation Consumer and AvWeb. Thanks for watching.